Good afternoon, doctors. Welcome to the Warrior One Spine webinar with our special guest, Dr. Pascal Breton. Your hosts today are Drs. Ed Quirk and Yuri Chupa. Go ahead, doctors. Hey guys, I'm going to start off today, and then uh, I'll, we'll do. The, I'll do like some of the light lifting, and then I'll lead the heavy lifting to Pascal. Uh, so, welcome to a, another episode of uh, Warrior One Spine. We'll be hitting the ligamentous instabilities of the cervical spine. I'll, I'll, with a little different view on what actually instability may look like when you're seeing it day to day. And, um, but before we get started, I wanted to make sure also that um, Pascal and Yuri and I um, want you guys to send us what type of topics you'd like to see for 2024 and 2025. We want to make sure that this is really relevant for not just you knowing um, you know, what's going on in research, um, in spinal reconstruction and, 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 um, spinal correction, but also we want to make sure it's topical, meaning that you can use what you're learning here um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you can send us your topics, uh, if you can do that today, that'd be great because it can give us a little heads up about uh, info at warrior.coaching.global. So that'd be awesome. So we can make it super relevant to not only you, but for the next generation to come up too. Um, also, just a reminder that you can um, watch all of these Warrior One um, webinars on YouTube at Warrior One Spine. So everything gets uploaded there. Also, um, for the Warriors, you, you guys can access everything from, from the Tactical Training Center. So you got all the research that all the webinars that have been posted in the past, whatever, three, four years. Um, also, you guys have been doing a great job, well, a few great jobs. You guys have been doing a great job in, with your patient testimonials within your practice and sharing the stories from the people that you guys take care of. Um, and you guys have been doing a great job um, sending them to us, and they're getting better and better. So you can continue whoever wants to actually continue sending up, um, sending us the videos at infowarriorcoaching.global. Make sure that they're less, they're, they got to be shorts, less than uh, 58 seconds, because we have no longer the time to be editing um, those videos. So we want them to come in already edited. Um, and you can see those videos at uh, Warrior One Spine on the YouTube, and also you can access all those videos also at the Tactical Training Center. Which brings me to the topic. Um, I was just talking with uh, Pascal, and he's going to be doing some of the high, high level stuff. I'm going to stay low level, and I'm going to stay low level, meaning that just where we are in practice and what we see on a regular basis and, and what we're going to um, well, I'm going to be showing you some cases that um, are current, meaning that I've seen these patients in the past three weeks. They're actually either brand new patients or active patients. And um, so, yeah, so we're, I, well, <laughs> I'm going to level. I, I'm going to take care of the low level, and Pascal's going to take uh, care of the high level. But when we think about ligamentous instabilities, a lot of times, you know, we have these flashbacks from you know, school where, you know, we know that, you know, instability in the upper neck can come from, you know, the, uh, you know, with severe whiplash, you know, injuries or diving injuries or anything where, you know, they hit hits, uh, the head hits a windshield or whatever, or, you know, the severe back and forth whiplash type injury. And then you guys remember, like, you know, we want to take maybe an inflection extension series to make sure that, you know, there's no possible you know, laxity of the, you know, transverse ligament and, you know, remember measuring those ADIs and spaces and stuff like that. And so that's what um, we talk about, or at least that's what we remember a lot of times from uh, cervical is that you got to be aware of, of not uh, only of whether you're going to adjust a certain area, but also how you're going to adjust a certain area. Um, now, today, my approach, I'm just going to take it a little bit different. I want to just look at the instability of the cervical spine. And so when I actually spent some time on some of the research articles um, uh, on the NIH Institute um, website, and when they talk about cervical instability, they don't only really talk about ligamentous instability. They talk about everything. A lot of the research papers talk about everything. So it's not just like... The, the actual ligament that's unstable. 
Um, they talk about, and most of the ligament in instabilities that we see in our practice is not due to one acute trauma, right? It's like we don't see them from the car accident to, you know, necessarily in our practice. Now we could, and we should be aware of that. But normally, we see ligamentous instability due to degeneration of subluxation, degeneration of spine, degeneration of disc over time, right? And that actually leads to severe instability. So most of our instabilities are progressive instabilities that we actually see. And, and you know, when... Well, many of you have read MRIs, you'll see a lot of times that they'll be like, they'll, you know, they'll talk about the ALL or the PLL, but a lot of times they'll talk about ligamentum flavum and ligamentum flavum, there's like a thickening, right? And ligamentum flavum is one of those ligaments as it thickens and there's can be a buckling of that ligamentum flavum that leads directly to spinal stenosis, right? And so one of the things that we want to look at is be aware of how we're perceiving perceiving what we see every single day and maybe just change the view of what we're see, seeing every day. And, um, and because what the research shows is that, well, what are the symptoms of cervical instability? Well, you name it, it's a symptom. So anywhere from obviously neck pain to arm numbness to like headaches, vertigo, dizziness, uh, drop attacks, right? The person just starts passing out for no reason. But if you look at instability of the cervical spine, it leads to loss of function and in severe, severe cases, organ system failure, but also something that we see on a, a, you know, on a regular basis, leg function failure, meaning that the person is losing leg function because of stability issues in the neck, right? And so I just wanted to, so I was just, you know, going through all that stuff um, um, over the past few days, but I just wanted to bring it real. So the past three weeks, okay. So what sparked this was this story right here. I'll just play it. I had this chronic back. I had this chronic back problem, which had been with me for years and years. And I was in my teens. So I fell from a bike and I fell on my tailbone. I never could sleep uh, at a stretch for more than three or four hours. Every time that I would turn in the bed, it was so painful. Couldn't even uh, turn my head properly. And I was able to sleep for six hours at a stretch. And that was the, was like a dream come true. Oh, I can sleep for six hours at a stretch. That was the biggest thing. And uh, I'm, so I'm sleeping better. My digestion is better. My mobility, my posture is, has improved dramatically. I would recommend this very strongly to all those people who are suffering from you know, pain like I did. They should at least give it a try. I'm sure that each one of us will be able to get some kind of benefit from this therapy. Benefit from this therapy. So this is a video that was sent out, uh, sent us, uh, that uh, Dr. Tyler Kong sent us. This is an awesome video. But what I want you to get is like, this is 25 years of pain and suffering since the mid-teens, 25, 25 years of undiagnosis slash misdiagnosis. And her being a medical doctor, most likely she was able to access very, very specific, you know, um, specialists. And, and still it gets undiagnosed slash misdiagnosis for a quarter century. How much money, how much pain and suffering for nothing over a quarter century, right? And so start thinking about that. So Eric came in. So February 15th, actually day after Valentine's Day, February 15th, there was a uh, a snowstorm coming into town. We were going to leave because we we're going to go see roads. So I want to get out of town. And it's like quarter to 10. And I like I was hitting the road at 10 o'clock. And quarter to 10, Eric shows up. He can't move. He's cocked over. His whole, both arms are completely numb and massive headache and he can't move. So I'm going, okay, well, what am I going to do? So you know what? Let's at least get this efficient. I don't want to like, have him hang for the next week. That's when I'm going to be back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an x-ray, took some x-rays, you know, and um, and he's been suffering like this for on and off for 10 to 15 years. Long story short, adjusted him, okay, immediately, okay, he, I did a CD cervical, he pops off the stool, and he starts to walk, and he goes, oh my goodness, and he, he let out a, you know, grand old yelp, 
and 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 just start walking he goes oh my goodness it's like a miracle he's just moving right like one adjustment okay one adjustment he's been suffering for 10 to 15 years one adjustment okay did his report last week now when you look at this obviously we know as spinal reconstruction specialists you know loss of cervical curve anterior carriage of the head you know three inches forward Punjabi translates to what maybe 30 pounds of extra pressure to the five six right we see the bone remodeling we actually see the spurring we can see you know the osteophytes or spondylophytes we can see the you know anterior disc wedging and we know tensile stretch to the spinal cord we all know this but what we have to see okay is this is not stable okay this is not stable this is unstable this is only going to get worse and i told eric i said the only way that this doesn't get worse is if we start getting that red line back to the blue line yes we want to increase the you know proper mechanics the segmental motion yes we want to take pressure off the spinal cord we want to take pressure off the off the you know the nerve roots but we want to bring that red line back to the blue line because it be creates more stability within the cervical spine, right? Glenn comes in last week, okay? He's 53 years old. He's my age, 53 years old. He can't move. He can hardly get on the table. He's completely immobile. He's bawling. He can't work anymore. He can't move his head. His, his his arms are, you know, are numb. He's got the whole dermatome stuff going on, you know, headaches and stuff like that. And he's just devastated. He says, I saw you guys on, you know, on, on social and I want to come in and I'm hoping you can help. And I'm going, Glenn, you've had some work before. He goes, yeah, well, you know, I've had the work before that, you know, in the C-spine, we see the spacers there, but Understand these spaces were inserted not after trauma. These spaces were inserted after massive masses of amounts of degeneration causing disc bulging. And after they did the spacing, he said, you know, it helped relieve it a little bit. I've been okay for a little bit, but now I'm losing my legs, right? Now I'm losing my legs. Wanda comes in. December 2023, we see the reversal. We know that the you know the reversal will degenerate the fastest, right? Right below the apex of the reversal, we can see the, the bone remodeling, the disc degeneration. We can see the anterior wedging. We know that that's going to produce disc bulging. She's come in with whole spinal pain, neck pain, headaches, arm numbness, the whole bit. She under she, she comes in for a report in early January. We, she, she starts care. Within two weeks, she's completely like no more no no more uh no no more symptoms feeling amazing and she had been suffering like this for 10 to 15 years and seen chiropractors seen mds seen all the specialists misdiagnosis or undiagnosed or both right well she's feeling so great she sends in her son michael michael's actually 23 years old got massive spinal pain massive low back pain massive um, um neck pain and has been on is on work WSIB. He's been going to see a physio three times a week, three times a week for seven months. He gets six adjustments just in his neck. Pain completely gone. But you know what? What we know about these two things is that if we don't reverse that curve back and if we don't get that red line back, it's going to continue to degenerate because this is a non-stable, this is unstable system. This is instability, okay, in general. Stephanie, Stephanie comes in January 2020. And just see how fast a reversal can happen, okay? Stephanie, 2020. Well, March 2020, the world goes crazy, right? COVID, I don't see Stephanie until she comes back in October 2023. Now, look how fast, okay, that reversal came into play. Why? Because that first x-ray is not stable. And as of January 2020, it's not stable. It's just going to get worse, while well, she goes through a couple of hits to the head, she's a goalie. She's got, you know, a reversal now. She's got anterior disc wedging, okay? She comes in now with, you know, neck pain that's worse, headaches, migraines, 
dizziness, right? And she was in yesterday. She was in yesterday. And because the past, she missed last week. And I said, why'd you miss? Is because now she's passing out. Out of nowhere, she passes out. Well, you know those drop attacks? She's passing out. They diagnosed her last week with GAD. Okay, so that was a new one for me. I'm going, like, what's GAD? They said, generalized auto uh, autonomic dysfunction. I said, oh, meaning that they don't know what's causing it, meaning that they're just saying that there's an imbalance between, you know, you know, the fight or flight and her resting, you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic. They said, that, yeah, that's exactly what they said, but they don't know what's causing it. Well, you know what? Maybe it's this that's causing it. Instability, right? Not stable. We have to bring that red line back because if we don't reverse the reversal, it's only going to get worse. This doesn't get better by itself. Shelly, 43 years old. Now, look at how fast degeneration can happen because sometimes we think in five or, you know, in terms of five years, 10 years, 15 years, you know, 20 years down the road. January 2020, Shelly's a biochemist. She's a PhD, okay? Works her time in the lab all day long, okay? Um, sticking needles in, uh, to mice's brains, literally, and dissecting mice brains, okay? So... So look at her. You know, we see it. We can see it. It's obvious to all of us. You know, five, six, January 2020. Well, COVID hits. She disappears for a couple of years, comes back. And this is what she looks like February 2023. Now, look at that. Look at the spondylophyte. How much more? Okay. Look at the, look at the disc degeneration. Look at the bone remodeling. And that is in like literally three years. Okay, so that's how urgent this is. And we don't see, do we see what's happening to the, you know, the discs? No, we, we can assume, right? Do we see the disc going back in the PLL? Do we see ligamentum flavum bulging or starting to bulge? Or do we see that, you know, the cross, you know, the, the scar tissue formation? We don't see any of that, but we can assume it. And we know because that's what the research shows, right? Now, what we do with reversals, this is what we did with reversals, okay, 50 years ago. This is a this is a fusion that was done 50 years ago. This is Adrian 19 and 93, well, 93 now, but she was actually whatever, 80, 88 back then. So five, six, seven, you can see the way they fused her. She had a reversal there, okay? She had a reversal. They fused her. Now she's coming in to see me. She says, well, I got neck pain. My arms are going numb. I got headaches, but I'm losing my leg function. She came in. Okay. She came in with a walker. Now look at this. You know, this, this upper part just looks like this wants going to eventually just slide right off the bottom part. Right. You can just see, you know, like the, the retro on this too. Now that might be a visual disturbance. I don't know, but it looks bad to me. Okay. Well, what can you do, doc? Well, this is her November 2022. Well, it looks better to me. Look, we got a better curve going to the upper, upper neck area. Look, the retro doesn't seem to be there. Maybe that's just a visual anomaly. I don't know. But it's better. How do I know it's better? Because she's one from walking with the walker, okay, to walking with the cane. And now most of the time she doesn't use anything. She'll use her, her cane once in a while, only when it gets a little slippery outside. She's still independent, lives by herself, actually um, lives by herself, drives by herself. And the biggest thing that her biggest thing was not the walking is because she was afraid of losing her arms because she's a big knitter and she knits um, as a way to give back to others. So like, how important is this, right? Now this surgical fusion didn't happen because of a trauma. Well, there's a trauma that led to progressive degeneration and it's a progressive de degeneration that led to this spinal fusion. Here's another spinal fusion. Christina, 53, March 2022, coming in with, you know, neck pain, headaches, migraines, drop attacks. If you get her giggling too much, she'll actually, you know, just pass out. So she's sitting on my table for one of the first times and, you know, I said something, I made her laugh and all of a sudden she passed out. And I'm going like, man, like... I that's something you should share with me. I said, how long has this been going on? She's all oh, forever since the surgery. I actually, all of a sudden, if I giggle too much, I pass out. 
well, like, oh my goodness, right? right? So surgical fusion, I actually adjust her, okay? So with Adrian, she's 93, I use an adjusting instrument, but with, with Christina, I literally adjust her, I do seated cervicals on her, okay? No more neck pain, no more um, arm numbness, no more headaches, and drop attacks have been reduced, and this is her uh, one year later, okay? You know, um, obviously, you know, and I still stimulate down below here, guys, with the, uh, the adjusting instrument by a, a do seated cervicals on, uh, on the upper part. Symptoms are amazing. Drop attacks almost all gone. So that's what you can do. Why? Because this is unstable, even though it's been stabilized in the lower neck area, this is still unstable. So we want to move it towards the st stability the best we can, right? This is Jack, 67 years old. He came in in January 17. He, he's a very, very successful businessman. I haven't seen him since January 17 because he's been down south somewhere. He loves playing golf. He comes in. He can hardly move. He's losing leg function, right? And he says, well, I don't think you can help me. That's why I haven't come and see you because I think, you know, nobody can help me. Well, can I help him? Can I help him? He comes in tomorrow night. OK, maybe you'll have to wait uh, for another time down the road whether, to find out what I what I told him, whether I could help him or not. But more importantly, guys, is that the question is, is that if Jack is sitting in front of you today, tomorrow, next week, next year, what will you tell him? All I know is that I can help him and I will. You guys are specialists, guys. You guys are specialists. Most of the people you guys see will be misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. Just stay, stay to your calling. Stay true to what you know. And now I'm going to let the high-level stuff be delivered by Pascal. Thanks, Ed. Great intro. Very apropos. Um, talking about the whole cervical spine being unstable. And I think that is, you know, if we could just sum it up. That's the takeaway message in this whole thing is that structure is what gives us our stability. And when we, when we start to see instability, whether it's intersegmental, whether it's at the spinal level as a whole, what we're trying to do to get that back is to um, bring the structure back. And you will see, I will show you the research that shows us that we are more stable when we have proper structural alignment of the cervical spine. And so why is it important for us to, to measure these things? Why am I bringing up this topic of specific ligamentous instabilities? And you also mentioned that word, Ed, it's, it's specialist. If you guys want to be considered specialists, if you want to be at the height of your game and be you know, respected amongst colleagues and other professionals that you really know what you're doing with the cervical spine, the spine in general, it's really important for us to understand these things. Furthermore, when you can have these conversations with your patients, when you can present this information to them, whether it's in the report of findings or when you're talking to them, you know, uh, table side when you're adjusting them, all of these things, the more knowledge you have as a doctor, as a professional, you know, th the more your patients are also going to have confidence that, wow, this doc knows exactly what they're doing. So you, it's important to understand that ligamentous instabilities are there. Why? Because you can predict how the spine is going to break down. Uh, you can predict some of the symptoms they're going to be having. Is it going to change the course of care that you're going to give them? Yeah, it might change how and where you adjust them, right? If there's a fusion in the cervical spine, well, I'm going to adjust them up top and stimulate them with the arthrostim, like Dr. Ed was saying. You know, if I see three, four levels of significant instability uh, down below, it might be because there's uh, the levels up top that are totally jacked up and fused and subluxated. So it tells me about how am I going to adjust them because I want to hit those segments that aren't moving properly. So understanding ligament instabilities, I think, is extremely important. And so today I'm going to teach you guys, number one, what are they? Number two, how do we measure slash diagnose them? What are the symptoms that present with ligament instabilities? How do they develop? And then lastly, but most importantly, what are we doing to correct these and bring stability back to the spine, right? So let's dive in. By the way, thumbs up. Everybody can see my screen okay? At least somebody thumbs up. Good. Cool. Okay. So in essence, what is a ligament instability, right? It's excessive motion between two adjacent vertebrae, right? Why does that develop? Well, we're going to talk about that later on. But basically, we're looking at two segments. Like if you look right here on this slide, posture measures this for me. You know, five and six are moving more than they should. 
Well, if that ligamentous instability stays there over time, am I going to start to see degenerative changes? Absolutely. As it degenerates and breaks down, will it become worse and worse, more of a reversal of the curve, more neck pain problems, blah, blah, blah? Yes, yes, and yes. So simply put, instability means when we're talking about two segments, it's abnormal movement between two segments and the symptoms that it brings. Dr. Also, uh, Ed also mentioned you know, what are some of those symptoms? So we'll cover those symptoms, but you guys see them in your practice every single day, even though you're not aware that potentially it's intersegmental or just full cervical instability. How do we diagnose it? Really by listening to the patient. When they come in and they start telling you about those symptoms and what's happened to them, you should be able to put two and two together that, yeah, this is likely a bad spine and it is not stable as it should be. The interesting thing is for us to measure or document ligamentous instability is very challenging, especially in Canada, because we don't have the true tools to be able to do it. And in a socialized healthcare system, you're not going to be able to send a patient for a functional CT or a functional MRI where, you know, they could do range of motion in a CT machine and the CT can actually document any type of ligamentous damage through the whole range of motion. Right. So functional CT, functional MRI or digital motion X-ray would be the gold standard to catch all of these true uh, unstable segments. But we don't have that stuff. Right. So I'm going to show you guys the bare bones basic with flexion and extension films and then op AP open mouth films where we can have the patient tilt their head side to side. You know, are we going to document all of every single instability doing that? No, not at all. But are we going to catch the very bad ones that we see at that end range of motion? Yes. Okay, so that's what we're looking at is those bad instabilities that we could see in the cervical spine with either flexion and extension films or AP open mouth lateral bending films. So basically, how does that happen? Right. Well, here you go. When capsular ligaments are injured, they become elongated and they exhibit laxity, right, which causes excessive movement between two cervical vertebrae. In the upper cervical spine, this can cause symptoms such as nerve irritation, vertebral basilar insufficiency with associated vertigo tinnitus, dizziness, facial pain, and arm pain, and migraine headaches. Who is going to see some of these patients today? You got it. Every single one of you will probably see patients today that have this type of condition going on, right? In the lower neck, it's even more plain vanilla, where we have muscle spasm, crepitation, paresthesias, and chronic neck pain. So pretty much almost every single person that is coming in, right? This stuff is highly underappreciated. Most of the patients that you have coming in likely have some form of ligament laxity in the cervical spine because of little micro traumas that have developed over time, the big car accidents, you know, sustained head flexion down, so on and so forth, causing instability in the facet joints. Those facet joints aren't stable anymore. As the head goes forward, you start to see what's called a shearing force. So, you know, the weight of the head starts to make those discs slip forward. Then you start to see that degeneration and that breakdown, kind of like you see right here, right? We start to see from one bone, sorry, I'm trying to draw this with my mouse, from the back of one bone to the next bone, what are you seeing C4 doing on C5? It's starting to slip forward. You notice the degenerative cascade in the discs, right? Here's a clear sign and symptom that this probably started right back here with some facet joints that got lax over time because of either bad posture, repetitive micro traumas, and then the spine becomes unstable and with time breaks down and you can start to see these visual changes of degeneration. And really the most evident one that we're gonna see day in, day out is the spondylolisthesis, one bone slipping forward on top of the other bone, right? That is ligamentous instability of the cervical spine. The one I think is really important for us to appreciate and understand because these are like the wow patients, kind of like, you know, Ed was talking about the adjustments where you adjust them once and like these miracles happen. When you catch these upper cervical instabilities, right? Not only one, these are the ones that are very temperamental. You have to be very careful with how we adjust them because it's unstable up there, but they're the ones where you get just amazing changes in them if we can help to resolve this upper cervical instability, right? So, so how do we measure it? Well, we talked about on lateral view, you're going to do a flexion and extension view right and then when we go to the open mouth views you open the mouth and you have them bend their head to the side kind of like you see right here and you go side to side and when we're doing uh, the flexion and extension view from the side, we're looking at all kinds of ligaments. We're looking at the integrity of the ligamentum flavum, the, the APL and the, uh, sorry, the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament, the interspinous ligaments, supraspinous ligaments and facet capsular ligaments. For our purposes, you know, we're not working in car trauma and so on and so forth. We're not doing medical legal cases. Do we care specifically which ligament is injured? No. 
We just want to know, is there excess of motion in certain areas of the spine? Yes, we want to know that. And specifically in the AP spine or the open mouth uh, upper cervical spine, we're looking at the alar and transverse ligaments. And I think those are some of the most important to look at, especially in cases of when patients have these symptoms such as vertigo, dizziness, tinnitus, facial pain, drop attacks, so on and so forth. So I'm going to tell a story right here on this patient, because this is one of my patients that came in about two months ago. So this patient comes in, he's 27 years old, he's a male patient, and tells me that in October this year, all of a sudden he started having these attacks of like significant vertigo where he'd turn his head to the side and he would feel like he wants to pass out, fall down. He would get nauseous and suffer like significant fatigue for the next couple of days. And sure enough, you know, nobody can seem to figure out what's wrong with him. Right. And, and so we we're going through the rest of the exam and the history. And he's telling me about a car accident he had back in you know his early twenties, but Oh, no neck pain. I was kind of fine from it. No big deal. Right. But you know, I shelf that in the back of my mind thinking about all the different scenarios and possibilities. So he's going through everything. And obviously in my mind, I'm going, let's do a cranial exam. Let's see, do you have some sort of lesion in your spinal cord? So we did a cranial exam to rule out any of the scary stuff. I want to make sure this guy's not having a stroke in my office and I'm not getting blamed for it. Rule all that stuff out. It's good. So right away, in my mind, I'm saying this guy's got upper cervical instability. No doubt about it. So I'm not going to do lateral bending films like this on all my patients. It's a waste of time. But in a case like this, where I think this is entirely a case of instability, we take the x-rays, he opens his mouth, and now I look at the atlas. So my red line here represents the edge of the atlas relative to the edge of my C2. His atlas is slipping off by 5.1 millimeters. That is grossly unstable grossly unstable, right? The limit of integrity, I'll show you, the limit for like considered a fair or a gross instability is 3.5 millimeters. This guy's atlas is slipping off 5.1. He wasn't in a car accident yesterday. He barely had any symptoms after the car accident he had in his early 20s. But there's that little damage, right? The instability that just builds over time. And if it if it's left unchecked, uncorrected, it gets worse and worse till one day, boom, he turns his head to the side and now he's passing out or wanting to vomit. Okay, so now we catch this. Now we can start to fix this with him and improve his condition. And guess what? We're just about to retake his three-month x-rays. Since we started chiropractic care and doing the right things, he hasn't had one episode or attack of dizziness, fainting, nausea, none of the above, right? So this stuff is super important to catch. But I changed how I adjusted him. I changed my care protocols based on this left atlas instability, okay? So I think it's very important for us to understand where they are and how to adjust them. So on flexion extension views, you know, I use software that measures all this stuff for me because realistically, if you're doing it by hand, you're wasting your time. So if you have software, if you're not using Posture Ray or a software that measures this, you know, it, you're going to take a lot more time to figure this out. But just so you understand how we're measuring it, you know, this is this is the standard way in the literature. This is the Cobb method. You put lines at the inferior end plates. Okay. When the patient bends their head forward or backwards, what we're looking to see is the amount of angle here. Is it bigger or more than 11 degrees from the segment above or below? So if I look here, we'll say two, three, I'm going to say there's virtually no angle between these two. These two lines are virtually parallel. So I'm going to say, let's say, let's pretend there's zero degrees here. Okay. If I bring this line back from the base of C3 and I bring this line back from the base of C4, let's pretend there's, we'll say 17 degrees here. Well, 17 degrees is 17 degrees of difference between C3 and C4. That's over 11 degrees of motion. That's a documented clinical instability, right? So you can measure those above and below, any segment above or below. If there's more than 11 degrees of movement between end plates, you have a documented instability, okay? You could do it going forward or you could do it going backwards, right? So here's the write-up on this. The end plate analysis for this area of the spine right, where we put inferior uh, tangential lines on the inferior vertebrae. This is from AMA guidelines documenting permanent impairment, right? So when patients have been injured, it doesn't have to be car accidents, right? This could be repetitive microtrauma again, but their cutoff is 11 degrees. So if you see more than 11 degrees of movement in any given segment, and this applies in a neutral film, you don't even have to do flexion extensions. If you see like Ed put up one of those cases there with a very bad kyphosis, a young girl who who, who had like the... Uh, it was like 2020 to 2023, you saw that degeneration and she was having the drop attacks. That's a perfect example. I bet you if we measure those end plates, she had like a kyphosis develop at 5.6 and then she was lower doses at 4.5. 100% 
you would see more than 11 degrees of tilt in those end plates in those segments, right? So you can see this, not even on flexion extension films, you'll see this on neutral films as well, okay? And here are the references from this stuff. This is all documented in the literature. Now, this is the way I would suggest you measure them. It's using the posterior tangent method. Why? Because you're gonna measure this, you're also going to measure the slippage in George's line, which I think is the more important one that we're going to see, which is the anterior, anterior and retrolisthesis, right? So if we're going to measure when how one bone slips forward on the other, kind of like here, so if I put my line up here and I look to the back of this vertebrae, I want to measure that horizontal distance. I'm measuring it via George's lines. So it makes more sense for me to use George's line because I can measure the slippage and I can measure the angular excursion between the two bones. Okay, so I can measure that slippage forward or backwards. Same thing. If it's over 3.5 millimeters, you have a gross instability. The research shows us that anything from one to three millimeters is considered a subluxation. Very cool. So we have another valid measure now that we can document in our patients and say, here's a valid measurement of your subluxations in the literature. So one to three millimeters of slippage, subluxation, over 3.5, gross instability. So when I'm talking about measuring the lines with George's line, right? So I would put a line behind this bone. I put a line up from this bone. You measure that angle between the two. Same thing. We're going to use our 11 degree cutoff. Anything above 11 degrees is clinically unstable, right? So again, you start thinking like, here's a perfect example. This is clinically unstable here. Well, why is this moving this much? Because six, seven or six, seven, one, this area is completely degenerated and broken down. Right. So where do I want to adjust this patient here where they're moving too much or here where they're degenerated, broken down, stiff and completely subluxated? You got to get this moving properly. You got to get this moving properly. So it takes the strain off of these segments that have to become hypermobile to compensate for fixated and subluxated spines. A lot of these are happening because those micro injuries that cause fixation, AKA subluxation in a spine, they stay there for a long time. Those fixated segments become degenerative. And what happens to the segments above and below? They have to become hypermobile to compensate, right? So this cascade, exactly like I talked about, is you know a small little issue that starts at first, that's left unchecked. And over time, it will break down to a completely unstable spine, right? You can measure it intersegmentally. All right, so the posterior tangent method is the one where we put George's line behind the bones. Again, this is what DEED and CBP uses because it has been studied and it has been shown to be far superior for the biomechanical analysis of instability compared to that Cobb method, okay? Again, they're talking about 10 to 11 degrees. I just use 11 degrees as a cutoff for myself because there could be a little bit of measurement error. But this is what's really cool when we're talking about now that translational movement, aka antero or retrolisthesis, right? Authors have noted that subluxation should be noted within a range of one to three millimeters, right? Here's your reference for that, right? This is not a chiropractic study. This goes back to, you know, a, a neurology journal in 1981. They were measuring this stuff and calling it subluxation, right? So you have improper movement or altered segment integrity. If it's one to three millimeters, it is a documented subluxation. And then where you go right here, the absolute clinical cutoff threshold is 3.5 mils. Above 3.5 mils, we've got some serious issues there. Okay. Now, what do they talk about? Of additional importance, improvement in the neutral lateral cervical lordosis has, be, has been shown to be associated with uh, significant improvements in the translational and rotational motions of the lower cervical spine. So what are they saying? Fix the curve, improve the curve, and what are you going to do? You're going to improve the translational movements, the slippage, and you're going to improve the rotational motions, right? So flexion and extension kinematics are partially dependent on the posture and the sagittal curve orientation. So if you've got a bad curve, if you've got bad posture, are you going to get instabilities? The answer is yes. So we talked about how we measure them. The AP open mouth, we can bend the head sideways and we're looking for that slippage of the side of the lateral mass over C2 on a neutral film. This is not even a flexion and extension film. Here's one of those perfect cases. Here's the back of C5, here's C4, right? If I'm measuring that horizontal distance, posture ray measured it for me here, four millimeters. So him just holding his head up in neutral position, he's got a significant instability in his cervical spine. Would any of you be surprised to find out that he's unstable based on what you see right here? I hope all of you would answer no, right? 
But am I going to change how I'm going to treat this person or adjust this person based on what I'm seeing here? Absolutely. I'm going to be focused on really creating as much motion as I can low down here. And what are we going to try to do? Get that curve back in there. And then lastly, of course, there's the flexion and extension films where we can also measure this, where we're looking for that angular excursion. You know, we're like here's a kid who just came out of a concussion. He's got obviously some instability at C5, 6. Why? Because he's got jammed up at C1, 2, 3, and 4. So he's not moving here at all, right? So what's happening at C5, 6? This is like right after his concussion. So this is an instability that happened immediately after a trauma right? The good news is we took care of him, we fixed his spine, and all of his concussion symptoms and this instability disappeared after fixing this fixation up here, okay? So we've got 3.5 millimeters on the open mouth views, or 3.5 millimeters of slippage on your lateral or flexion and extension views, and over 11 degrees of curve between any segment on flexion and extension views, and or just their neutral lateral cervical as well, okay? All right, so how do they develop? Everybody knows they develop from the macro trauma, right? The car accidents and so on and so forth. And a lot of this literature comes out of the U.S. because being a litigious society, they want to document this stuff because I will tell you, our colleagues in CVP, the guys who are working on these and document this are making a fortune and a killing because the independent medical examiners, when they try to cut their costs and cut their bills, they don't have a leg to stand on. When their docs are like professionals, they understand these and they can document these instabilities. Guys like Dr. Evan Katz, who was one of the ones who wrote this uh, literature, this paper, those guys are absolutely killing it and they are getting paid a fortune to take care of patients like this because a lot of these patients end up with permanent injuries, right? So we know the car accidents, great, the big ones, but that's not the everyday case you're gonna see, right? And I put this picture in here because this is truly showing us how a lot of ligamentous instability is occurring now, right? This is from that paper that I showed you earlier. This is ligament laxity can occur from a single macro trauma, such as a whiplash injury, or can develop slowly as cumulative micro traumas, such as those from repetitive forward and bent head postures. This is right out of an orthopedic surgical article, right? In either case, the cause of injury occurs through similar mechanisms leading to capsular ligament laxity and excess motion of the facet joints, which often results in cervical instability. Right. So we're seeing this more and more because people are spending so much time repetitively bending their heads forward and not building any strength to that cervical spine either. All right. So how do we correct it? Very simple, guys. It's CBP. Right. If it's not CBP, it's the same protocol of exercise, adjustments and traction, exercise, adjustments and traction. We have to get the spines moving properly. You have to get the ligaments back into proper position and you have to build strength and stability for the spine to be able to hold it in position. So here's a great article written by Dr. Curtis Fedorchuk, Dr. Lightstone and Dr. Evan Katz, all three CVP instructors. And this is really cool because I mean, they didn't publish this in a chiropractic journal, which I love. It's published in radiology case reports. This is such an important paper because they're showing that this type of corrective chiropractic care can not only reduce those antero and spondylolisthesis, but they've got the word subluxation in there. So they're pushing forward for corrective care chiropractors and building uh, basically a database showing that there should be treatment guidelines out there for patients who have these types of issues. And it shouldn't just be a watch and wait condition. Because let's face it, right now, if these someone that's got a type of degenerative uh, process in the neck and they go to their medical doctor, is the medical doctor going to tell them to come see a chiropractor? Heck no, right? They're going to be like, here's some pain meds, basically, you know, watch and wait until we get to go put some hardware in your neck, kind of like you saw in some of uh, Dr. Ed's patients there, right? So right now, it's a wait, watch and wait condition. But more papers that we can get like this, the more papers that we can get on proper constructive chiropractic care we can start to build treatment guidelines where this will be the default for patients with cervical instability, right? So let's see what they talk about in the abstract. Cervical spondyl low list theses. So antero and retros, right? The slippage indicates instability of the spine and can lead to some symptoms. Great. Currently degenerative cervical spondylosis or spondylolisthesis is a wait and watch condition with no treatment guidelines, right? So here are eight females that they took from their clinics. The radiographs reveal what? abnormal cervical alignment, spinal canal narrowing, and spondylolisthesis. After 30 sessions of chiropractic biophysics over 12 weeks, 
patients reported improved symptoms and disabilities. Radiographs review, uh, revealed improvements in cervical alignment, spondylolisthesis, and spinal canal diameter. So what is the conclusion of this article in a radiology journal? Improving spinal alignment may be an effective treatment to reduce vertebral subluxation and cervical spondylolisthesis and improve neck disability as a result of improved spinal alignment. How cool and how important is this paper for our profession? So here are some of the pre-post x-rays from that paper, right? So pre and then post. So you see slippage, instability, after 30 sessions, no more instability, right? What did they do? You can see down there from there. Sorry, I got to move this out of the way here. What did they do? Their intervention, mirror image adjustments, exercises, traction. We look now here. We've got pre, we've got post. It's very obvious. You've got multiple levels here. Instability, 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 right? Multiple levels afterwards. Is it perfect? No. Right, but this has probably been building for years. Is it substantially better? Are all of those instabilities reduced? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. What did they do? Same thing, 30 sessions of mirror image, spinal adjustments, exercises, and traction. Instability, instability, instability. What happens afterwards? Beautifully all on the line, right? No more slippage, all gross instabilities reduced. Instability. Instability, instability, right? Afterwards, not perfect, significantly better. Last one, this is actually a very cool one, right? Significant, significant, and significant. And look at this. I mean, that's a decent lordosis coming back in. After 30 sessions, I mean, this is a wow change for a spine after 30 sessions of corrective care. You know, that is a significantly unstable spine. That is going to be a train wreck within months if it's not corrected. And now this patient obviously still needs continued care. They are not where they need to be yet, but they are substantially better and moving in the right direction, right? So we know how to do this stuff, guys. It's mirror image adjustments or just specific adjustments. You use the dental rolls for traction. You use the neck exercises to build the curve, the strength on the curve. And then you can have them wear head weights depending on where that instability is. I use a lot of head weights too with patients who have instability because you want to build that strength and stability to hold the head in position once you've done your exercises, your traction, or sorry, once you've done your prolordotic exercise, you've done your traction, you've done your adjustments. I often send them home with a head weight as well and tell them to wear head weights for 10 10 minutes to build that stability, to regain that strength in the spine because they're unstable, right? And a lot of times what has to happen is once you've got that ligamentous damage, you can improve some of it, but a lot of times you have to um, sort of complement stability by having a stronger back or a stronger neck because you're never going to fully regain all of that ligamentous stability, right? So they have to become strong because muscles have to comp compensate for some of those damaged ligaments, especially those that have far gone. And I think I saw Dr. Covey just put his head weights on. Good job, Dr. Covey. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. So that's all I got for you guys. As always, there's a coupon code there for you that's valid for two weeks. So WQ124, you could use it for the next two weeks. And it's for anything 10% off uh, of any of the tools in the store to help you guys obviously fix and correct these spines. My contact info is there for cases, questions you might have. And then lastly, there is a YouTube page where I put tons of videos on of how to use these tools in clinical practice in case you've never seen how to use a dental roll, uh, prolordotic, do the wall angel. So so on and so forth. We've tried to put them up on this site so you have a guide and a reference. All right.